Welcome to another a Cognizant webinar. What's happening? What's happening? So uh, real quick, let us know where are you tuning in from? Let us know in the chat. Uh, we always like to see it. And what we're doing here today is something a little bit different. You know, typically we like to go into some tactics, SDRs and the account executive, but we're talking to the leaders today. So we're talking about the next layer of that, which is time management, which is absolutely important. Most people think this is, oh, this is one-on-one. No, this is this is important information. And I can't think of someone better than Todd. And we're going to do an introduction here in a minute. But as everyone tell us where you're tuning in from, we just want to get a gauge. And before we do that, I have, a, I have a fun question today. So I was on another live stream earlier today, and we asked this question. It was curious to see what people's responses were, because I found some new candy that I'm going to try out. So Todd, for you, what is your favorite candy? Good question. I'm not a huge sweets person. I'll tell you what, I'm addicted to sunflower seeds, but from a candy perspective, I think peanut M&Ms. Peanut M&Ms. Okay. I haven't had those before. The yellow wrapper. Very good. Okay. I'm going to check that out. For y'all in the audience, favorite candy, let us know. Uh, mine is Sour Patch Kids. They're just, they're too, they're addicted. They're really addicting. Like I have to, I have to stop. Like if I have a pack, like I will eat it like in one sitting, which is like not good, which is why I don't get them often. So, but they are, they are legit. That's a road trip necessity. I'm like it no is. candy, no candy, road trip, sour patch kids overload. Yeah, exactly. It's really good. So, all right, y'all. Oh, s <laughs> that's funny. Smarties because you are what you eat. <laughs> That's a good one. All right, y'all. So let let's let's get into it. So uh, without any further, you know, introduce uh, introduction. Uh, let's talk about sales management. Let's talk about time management. Before we do that, Todd, just quick introduction on yourself, and then we'll dive into it. Yeah, hey everyone. Thanks to be here. My name is Todd Buster. I'm uh, one of the co-founders and CEO of Champify. Um, Champify helps people tap into their best prospecting source, which is former customers and former buyers, makes it really easy to drive pipeline through repeat buyers. Before Champify, I spent six years at a product analytics company called Heap, where I was the first rep, joined at five people, uh, left when they were around 300 people, made every mistake under the book, as, uh, under the sun as an AE, as a frontline manager, as a VP of sales. So a lot of battle wounds that I'm here to share today. And uh, I'm your host, Morgan Jangram. Uh, I work with Cognizant on the creative side. Also uh, have my own company, Assistant Media Productions. We help people produce shows through employee advocacy and also have been a former sales trainer as well. So I'm excited about this conversation today um, as we dive into it. And really when it comes to time management, let's just get a pulse for everybody before we go to the next slide and go in this conversation. But a scale of one to three, how would you rate your time management as a sales leader, so one being like, I need help and my day is chaotic, or three, like, I feel extremely proficient in what I do. So one is chaos all over the place. Three is like, I feel pretty buttoned up. You, you could obviously learn a couple of things, but three, you feel buttoned up on it. So we'll see what those answers are there. All right, cool. So mostly, we got mostly twos here. Mostly twos. 1.5, you know, we got... <laughs> We could do that too. 1.5s. All right. So for the majority of people in here, we're going to say you're on a 1.52 scale. And the goal is, is to get you from 1.5 to 2 and then 2 to 2.5. Like that's, that's the goal. I mean, we're gonna, we might get you 2 to 3. I mean, if we do, like we'll, we'll come back to you and we'll see what you think you are after this session. Uh, Todd's got some amazing things to share, but the goal is to get you at least 0.5 up, 1 to 2 at least. All right. So as we go to the next slide, we're going to be diving into you know, what is the process when it comes to managing your time? And why is this important that you do manage your time? So Todd, again, you have a ton of sales leadership experience in the past, you know, I came in and trade your team. And also now, you know, you're working with a ton of sales team as the founder of Champify. Talk to us about why this is important. Yeah, this is why I think it's important. So if you go back, I'm actually curious for people in the audience, drop a, a one if you've started your careers in SDR or even SMBAE. Curious to see how many people. <clears throat> okay, oh, shout out, shout out to the OG. Okay, shout out to the, oh, we got some SDRs coming in hot. Love it. I, I say this because if you think back to your SDR days or first time maybe as an SMBAE role, like you were taught, this is how your day should look, right? This is what a calendar block should be. This is how much 
percentage of your time should be spent calling versus emailing versus going after closed loss versus event leads. It was very clear, like, here's the metrics. Okay, roughly how much time it takes to do each one of them, or, you know, whether it's tightly partnered activities with your AE, right, the outcomes would follow. If you transition that to a sales rep, it's also pretty clear, right? I have to advance deals through deal management and strategy. Um, and I need to figure out how to drive more pipeline. Like it, it's very, very clear. But as a sales leader, the variables increase, right? You have to be creating top of funnel. You have to do deal management and strategy. Forecasting takes up a lot of time. There needs to be some type of training and enablement and onboarding. You're also probably in a lot of interviews. You're in one-on-ones. You have to do career development, right? Um, if you're a good sales leader, you're also probably getting pulled into a lot of ops conversations, a lot of marketing product saying, hey, I want to pick your brain. You're in a lot of these conversations. The, the harsh reality is no one teaches you how to spend your time as a sales manager, right? And what a common trap people fall into is when they don't know what to do, they fall into super rep mode, right? It feels like a good use of time to do another call with one of your reps, to do another one-on-one that's really not a one-on-one. It's about deal strategy of two or three deals. So what I think the, the most intentional sales leaders, the ones that have done really well, they're very, very thoughtful about where they spend their time. And I'll use the word intentional a lot today. They're very intentional about what they're saying yes to, what they're saying no to. And, and you've all seen it, right? There's the sales leader that is running around, super stressed out, looks like their their head's cut off. They're in meetings back to back all day. And then you see that other sales leader, you're like, this, this guy or gal seems really calm. They always seem to know exactly where they're going to land from a forecast perspective. And that's not an accident. It's because they understand how to spend their time in the right areas that are going to get the most bang for the buck and where their time can compound. I love that. So for a leader today that's listening in, um, you mentioned where it's going to compound and there's a lot of variables. This answer obviously is dependent on the organization. But let's just say you have a new person that's starting on your team, a new sales leader. And they have a lot of variables that are going on. What were the three variables that you would lock into for them to help manage their time? And then how could help, how would that help them compound? Yeah. So the first thing is, is do an inventory of where you are. So who's, who's on my team, where are their different skill gaps? Uh, how would I even rank individual reps based on a variety of different things, pipe gen, accelerating deals, cross-functional communication, et cetera. And then you need to think about, and we'll get into this a bit, think about, okay, where are the biggest gaps today, right? A lot of organizations today are like, hey, we just don't have enough pipeline. We don't have the coverage that we had. If you're in the fortunate situation to have a lot of pipeline, it might look a lot different and you might need to invest more of your time on the next quarter from an enablement perspective, from a uh, upskilling perspective, right? Um, it really depends where your organization is. So I don't think there's a one size fits all. Throughout my career, I've had it at different points where we didn't have enough reps and we had a pipeline and we had a lot of pipeline. You're, where you're going to spend time looks different than, hey, we don't have any, you know, we have nothing in the pipeline, right? So it really depends on where you are. And I think it starts with an honest look in the mirror and honest inventory of, okay, what can move the needle the most and then determine your strategy very intentionally. Okay, no, that's perfect. And so, uh, by the way, as we're talking, Feel free to drop questions in the Q&A. Feel free to join in the conversation as well um, as we're going about this. So now that we understand the why, uh, let's move forward here and, and really dive into this a little bit deeper. And when I, when I think about what you just said, when it comes to moving the needle, you do need a plan. So we have an infographic here. Obviously, you all can look at this infographic. You may have questions. But as we're looking at this, like, how are you coming up with this plan so you can give people a path to success? Talk us through these numbers. For sure. So again, put your belt, <clears throat> put yourself back in the seat when you started as an SDR, right? You said, okay, I need to get eight meetings or I need to get 10 meetings or six ops, whatever that goal may be. And it was pretty clear. It's like, okay, here's roughly the activities that go into that based on previous conversion rates, based on previous historicals right? To understand what you need to do. I think the same thing needs to happen for sellers, right? So when I, if I'm starting as a new sales leader, what I want to do is get really close with ops, get really close with marketing. It could be a marketing leader, COO, CRO type of leader that understands pipeline sources, but you need your primary job as a sales leader is give your team a blueprint for everything they need to be successful. And I think that starts with the numbers. So do, do they know how to be successful? Do they know the paths to get there? So in this example, there's a concept of what I call a recipe card, right? 
which is basically saying, okay, if you need to get to your $800,000 quota in a year, that's $200,000 a quarter. You have an average selling price of 40K. Here's roughly how you should get there, right? Here's how many meetings you're going to need via inbound. Here's how many meetings you're going to get with your SDR. Here's how many you should source. Here's roughly the conversion rates that have happened over the last couple quarters. And then what you can do is you can be strategic with your rep and understand where their skills and weaknesses lie to help impact this, right? I've worked with sellers that say, hey, this is great. Thanks for showing me this. But I know I can't rely on inbound or, or my SDR to get me there. So here's my plan to try to get a 50 or 80% lift on my contribution to pipeline. There's other sellers that are like, look, I'm not great at managing 20 ops at once. I'm going to put all my eggs in these 10 account basket. And what I'm going to try to do is increase my win rate and increase my ASP. That's a great strategy too, right? And you should be working that out with your, your individual contributors. But I think you have to give them this blueprint so they know that there's, there's a, a variety of different paths to success. And then you can develop the plan for, okay, what do we need to do to get there? And and the plan to get there, like you said, this this is this is more like formulaic, like every single person is going to get this. But the plan to get there will be different depending on the rep and their strengths and weaknesses. Exactly. Like there's some reps I worked with in my time at Heap are also in the unusual portfolios and as an um, operator in residence that are like, this is great, right? But like, I'm not going to play the transactional game. I know that I'm, I'm way more relationship based. And, and you, we've had reps at Heap that, you know, we might have had an average deal of 35K and there was reps that consistently their average selling price was 70, 80K. And that was a different strategy that they took. There was others that say, hey, I don't want to put all the eggs in one basket. It's going to be a mix of a lot of transactional deals. That means I need to increase the number of opportunities I'm getting into, right? So it should just be a yeah. strategic conversation based on strengths and weaknesses. How do so a leader listening in right now is like, okay, that's great, strengths and weaknesses. How do I def, how do I decipher the strengths and weaknesses of my reps? I mean, it could be a straightforward question: What are your strengths and weaknesses? But what observations should I be doing? What can I be doing to actually find that information? So. I know I can at least proactively start building this plan for them, uh, knowing what their strengths and weaknesses are. It goes to two points. The, the, the quant component, which is like, I'm a nerdy sales leader. I've always been a very ops focused sales leader. If, if that's not your strength, get with the sales ops team because this, this needs to become a strength. So the first part is when you come in, you let's say you take over a team, Morgan, of, of eight reps, you're just starting out. When I, when I talk about an inventory, what I like to do is look at the previous X number of periods. Maybe it's two quarters, maybe it's five months, whatever it is based on the velocity and get an understanding of, okay, where do these people fit from a conversion rate and win rate perspective? Where do these people fit in terms of their average deal versus the rest of the organization? And that allows you to get an understanding of, hey, here's what the numbers are saying. Here's what the math is saying. And then in your one-on-ones, in getting to knowing your team, in listening to calls, that's the qual component of like, okay, is what this rep is saying, do I agree with that? Like, do the numbers agree with that? Do we think this is a winning strategy? Okay. Love that. And then going a little bit further, because a lot of people came in here and said that they were SDRs. You mentioned SDRs. Do you pair SDRs if there is this is a thing? Because sometimes you can't do this. But let's say if it's a one to one, are you pairing those SDRs and AEs based on strengths and weaknesses and taking it to the next step? In an ideal world, I think yes. I think the reality is that doesn't really happen, right? Yeah. Every company is always shuffled. There's always this game. So, like big picture, I'm a big fan of pods. I think when you have an SDR working with one to three AEs together, there's learnings, there's constant communication, there's a good workflow in terms of how they communicate, a cadence of how often they meet. But the reality is, as territories are moving, as people are growing, it's really hard to do that. So, I don't think most company work look at that from hey, let's balance strengths and weaknesses. I think it's more like what's happening in the business and you have to deal with it. Um, it, it. It depends on how quickly the org's growing as well. Another thing you mentioned here is like meetings needed, right? Uh, but also as well, there could be obviously collaborations with other departments like a marketing. You mentioned ops, but when you think about time management as a sales leader, it's not only time management with your team and planning with your team, it's planning with marketing. Could you talk a little bit more about that too? Definitely. So, you know, as a, as a rep and as a sales leader, I would always see, okay, I'm, I know I'm going to get eight of my 29 meetings from inbound or from a PLG motion. Do I have confidence in that? I would like to know what's happening over the next 
three months in the marketing strategy that's going to give me confidence for that to happen, right? Is there a big event that's coming? Is there a big new product release? Is there a big competitive campaign coming down the pike that I know that would, hey, we've done some version of this. If we do it on steroids, right? Do I feel comfortable in that number? So like you definitely want to understand what's marketing doing, not just blindly trust like, okay, in order for me to be successful, you know, 20% of my pipelines coming from inbound, do I know what they're doing to generate that? Right. Do I have confidence in that? Um, am I giving my input if they, if they want it to help influence that numbers as, as much as you can. Okay. I love that. So we have that breakdown. Let's go to the, ne to the next piece here and dive into, uh, what does good look like? So I want to go into this example. You know, most of you were on a sales call before you've been on a sales call. And the reason I have this pilot example is because if you ever go on a on a plane, so check it out. You'll see like a, the, at the very front if you ever go uh, check this. They have to have a checklist before they even take off, right? They have to be like, okay, we got the gas, we have the right lights, we have the, the right fluid, oil, whatever, et cetera. So before they even take off, they have to go to this checklist. If they do not do that, then they could go nowhere, right? And so when you as a leader, right, are talking to your team, you also have to go through what should they be doing for prospecting, running a, a meeting, a demo before they take off and start selling and doing these different motions, right? That's going to be incredibly important because if you have them doing things that you don't want them doing, it's not going to pay it out very well. So as a, as a leader, we have to think about ourselves as these pilots, right? Going through our checklist, making sure that it makes sense, validating that it all is going in the right direction moving forward. So Todd, talk a little bit more about how you have helped teams show them how what good looks like and then how are you allocating that towards their time it's a great point i mean there's a reason why these checklists exist right if you've read the book checklist manifesto there's a reason why pilots and or doctors ask you multiple questions at the same time it works it's important the core part of this and i'll even step back i think tech sales in general is like 90 percent preparation I think the people that prepare well for a call, the people that still have some structure on how they want to run a discovery call, they have an exact goal of what they want to happen by the end of the meeting from an ejection standpoint. They think through what are probably the four or five hardest questions I'm going to get before I enter a call. I think the what good looks like starts to get broken down in each component of this. So how do you actually prepare for a call? If I'm a new sales leader, what I do is I know there's a handful of reps that do it really well, and I try to systematize that. So do they have a pre-call checklist? Do we make sure that the people that are come, you know, you listen to a gong call or mm. whatever it may be, and you see people that aren't really well prepared, that should never happen. You only get one shot at a first impression. Um, so here's what a checklist looks like. If you have more experienced sellers are going to say, yeah, I know, but still you should have that, right? You should still have, this is exactly what good looks like on running a meeting. Same idea. You might, you don't need a pure script, but you need a, a, a structure on, this is what goes into a really good meeting from setting an agenda, from good discovery questions, from digging into pain to dropping customer stories that are relevant. And then the same thing on running a demo, same thing on negotiating. And at different points, and again, I go back to this inventory because it's really important to understand where is the team weak overall? And then how do I systematically improve that? Not in one-on-ones where the team isn't getting the whole benefits of those conversations. It's across the board, right? I remember doing a a negotiation and pricing training at Heat because we were seeing that uh, we had issues with big discounts, right? So that's showing them what good looks like. And tactically, what that means is here's an Excel sheet that has our gives and gets by order, right? Exactly what we're willing to give, exactly what we're willing to get, how you should stack rank them, why you should never do more than three at a time. And then to actually get this behavior in place, it's trying to co-create some of the documentation with the best reps having them lead some of the trainings for your team and then celebrating when people are doing it well. That could look like a gong tracker when someone talks about some keyword in negotiation and make sure everyone's seeing that. And then same thing when it's not going well and quickly you'll start to level up the, the whole entire organization. So when you're thinking about coaching, cause you just mentioned that uh, if you find out a key topic and you want to drill into that, how much time should a sales leader be focusing on coaching? I think a lot. I think it's a, arguably the most important thing you could do. I think the key is not getting in the trap where all of the good lessons and coaching are happening in a one-on-one -on -one environment. 
what you ultimately want to do is have as much coaching as possible happening in, in your team meetings, in your regional meetings, where your best reps are actually doing some of the coaching on behalf, right? So whether you're pairing people up uh, to review certain calls together, where you're doing role plays in a group, the more that's happening together and less in one-on-ones, the better, right? Because you're trying to figure out how do I scale myself? How do I scale my brain, my institutional knowledge? And if you're doing most of that in one-on-ones, you're probably missing the opportunity to do one-to-many. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like, scaling out your knowledge scaling out those different systems uh, i think is really important and but it all starts with showing them how it's going to work and what good looks like so let's let's go on to the next thing here and we're really just going to take some time to dive into the operating cadence you've already talked about how you should be looking at your calendar how you should be coaching but if you let, well, let's start with the first question here which is if you had to look at any of these for ever, all the leaders in here what do you feel like is like the most important that they should be building on an operating cadence and for everyone tuning in as well what do you feel like you need the most help on as well so maybe todd can speak to it and maybe have a question on it we're happy to go into it but if you were looking at this operating cadence todd what's the number one thing you should focus on as a sales leader and for people in the audience where do you feel like you need the most help yeah, I'd love to see what people think, but so in the forecasting strategy and kind of rules, a lot of time that's going to be pushed down from your VP of sales, from your CRO. You can't really influence it dramatically. I think the the part you need to figure out is like, what's my cadence? So if we do our, if I'm the sales leader and I have my VP forecast call on Thursday, I would make sure every Wednesday that I'm doing it with my team, right? Just to make sure it's most up to date right before it happens. And you really can't dictate too much away from what your leadership wants on that front. On the enablement plan, I think most organizations underinvest in enablement. Right? I had a, a new CEO start when I was at Heap, and he said, you're going to run training every single Friday. And I looked at him. I said, this is crazy. Every single Friday, we're doing some type of enablement. And it was one of the best things we've done. Right? And what it, it, it challenged us to do was figure out where are the areas where we're weak, and then how do we have a plan, not scrambling the day before saying, what are we going to train on? We were really methodical about this is exactly what it should look like. This is exactly who's going to lead it. This is exactly what I want people to learn, what I want people to feel, and then what I want people to do. And that goes to Eric's point, like every point you have to inspire and motivate when you're in a meeting, when you have an opportunity to get the intention of all your team, it's what do I want them to learn? What do I want them to feel? What do I want them to do? I really like that framework because it makes all these trainings, makes all these team meetings important. And then the, the question becomes like, okay, if we have more of a pipeline problem, I might need to spend more time on the strategy of our pipe gen campaigns, our PG kits, as we used to call them. If it's, hey, we have a lot of pipeline and we're seeing deal velocity slip or our, our, our win rate go down or our deal size go down, it should be enablement on the tactical stuff of, are we actually going deep enough on the discovery? Are we positioning versus competitors properly? So it really depends where you are. And then the fourth one is on the talent development recruiting. Like, Right now, we're in a world where we're probably not growing as fast as most companies were two years ago. But yep. you know, when the, when the core role of a lot of these sales leader was build teams, right? a lot of the enablement, a lot of the pipe gen activities was kind of an afterthought. And I think when you have a really good operating cadence, it decreases the chance of this stuff getting pushed off, right? Like you should have these calls. The way we run our team is every third, you know, we have weekly one-on-ones with reps. Every 30 days, you have like a career check-in where it's just like, okay, are you learning the things you're, you want to learn? Is there any risk of this person leaving? What else do I need to give them outside of work or more money, more equity, a new comp, whatever that may be, you want to know about that early. And if you have the right operating cadence, that allows you to make sure all it's doing is decreasing the risk of it not happening or not happening in a timely manner. And then to, to, to Eric's point in the chat, on a winning culture, I think the way to inspire and to motivate is to give a lot of credit when people are doing well, you know, take as little credit as possible, even if you're impacting that, build people up in your organization and try to build a culture where people are learning. So this could be you have a deals loss channel for your team and you're actually going through deals, not pointing fingers, but trying to understand from every loss or when wins are happening, you're boosting that wrap up and giving her a chance to talk to the entire team on why. And the more you build some of those folks up, you'll start to see that they're naturally going to be inspired. They're naturally going to be motivated. 
I love all that advice. Eric, let us know if that was helpful and, and how to inspire and motivate anyone else listening in. If there's something that you're like, hey, I, I, I need some help here on this. You know, we're more than happy to dive into it here with Todd. I think you broke down a lot of things. I think the most important thing, the, the theme here, uh, what I heard is like decreasing the risk. So if you have these operating cadences, you're overall decreasing the risk, right, of every single thing that you're doing. And you know, I, I love that. Uh, shout out to Rick. He said, love the feel, no, do framework for team meetings. Uh, that is great. And then here's a, I guess there's a comment that came in here. Talent development with limited resources. So we, we were talking about the talent development. You mentioned you were doing something every Friday. Christian's saying here, well, okay, what if I have limited resources? What's your take on that? How could you help here? The reality is that's true for most organizations. I don't care how big you are. Like everyone probably feels some set of that. I don't think talent development is something that should be owned from outside of you. Like you own that. When I think about talent of development, it's two different components. The first component is if you're a really good sales manager, you should never be surprised when someone's leaving. They should, you, you should have created an environment where you know exactly what they're feeling. You know exactly what they want in their career progression. And you know sometimes where you're not going to be able to meet that. And it might make sense for this person to leave. So when I think about talent development, it's having the operating cadence to make sure every 30, 45, or 60 days, you're having those specific career chats. Because what happens is most people do that as agenda item number 10 on a weekly one-on-one, and it never happens, right? When you have a dedicated time for this, what will happen is you understand, hey, gut check, are you still happy? Like, are you still having fun? Do you still believe in the mission? Do you have a chance to understand what that person's motivated by? And are you helping get there? Some people, it's all about money. Just show me the way to make the most money here. I'm going to be happy. Others, they don't care about that. They care about winning. They care about career progression. Um, we, and during my time at Heap, we actually had meetings to understand, okay, who are the top most valuable people in the organization? Hopefully a lot of them are on your team and you understand what they're motivated by so you can retain them. And a lot of this might be things outside of, your core company. Example, I had a rep on my team. He told me from day one, I'm trying to make a lot of money because I want to start a company. And I need to be able to not make money for six to 12 months as I'm trying to do that. Great. So we showed a path going back to that recipe card. And here's what you can do to make a lot of money. Outwork on these areas, influence these metrics, and you'll get there. And then what we did is I tapped into some of my networks, tapped into some of our exec team network and said, hey, who are the best entrepreneurs this person should be meeting with? And what he was doing is he was tapping, he was getting into the network and learning things that he wanted to do two years out. And that was keeping him around and keeping him productive, right? So I look at talent development from how do you retain the best people? How do you always have a gut check? And then how are you constantly up leveling them? Because people leave when they're not learning anymore. I think that's the main reason why people leave. And it's your job to figure out how to keep that going. To Christian's point, this could be you and your team running trainings. This could be bringing in people like Morgan Ingram. This could be, you know, trying to fight for budget to, to send them to a sales manager course if that's what they want next. But you should have a plan there. Well, that Christian, did that help answer your question there? Or that was a comment really diving into that. I think, I mean, what you said there, people leave when they're not learning. Absolutely. Right. And especially in an environment where there's more people creating content, there's more people out there, they're going to go find the person that, is giving them new information, right? Because you're going to feel stuck. You're going to feel stagnant. I also like how you have mapped out these plans. Now, before we go on to the next slide, you mentioned that you have this pretty well mapped out. Is this a three, six, 12 month plan? Or it obviously is dependent on like how long the person wants to be there. Are you showing them like, hey, if you're here for a year, here's the things you need to do. Like how far out do you go with this plan? I think doing anything more than a year in today's workforce is probably too far, yeah. but you should have that gut check with them. Like, Hey, how long do you see yourself here? Like what would influence that? And a lot of times you're going to learn like, Hey, you know, I see there's no opportunity for management, which might be true. The company just isn't growing fast enough. Therefore there's not a, enough of those opportunities, but you should know about that and then understand what are the other things that's going to keep them around and keep them productive. That's your job. That's your sole job is to hire and retain really good talent. Um, and I just don't think people spend enough time on it. Yeah. So everyone keep that in mind. I think everyone walking out of here, it's about something that you need to figure out. How do I continuously have my team learning new things? So they're engaged, they're involved. So keep that in mind for every single person that's listening in for that. And let's go on to the next piece here. And as we do that, 
Uh, quick question for everybody out there. I know we've been answering some questions. If you find this helpful and insightful so far, let us know in the chat. We want to make sure we're, we're we're providing you insight and value here. You've taken 30 minutes of your time already, so let us know. We just want to make sure we're going on the right track. Shout out to Christian uh, coming in there. Uh, we appreciate it. But now we're going to dive into this. So this is one of the things we were talking about, the campaign kits uh, for PG. Walk us through a couple of these data points so that everyone has some clarity around what's going on. Yes. Yeah, so when I when you think again of taking the inventory of your team, understanding as a sales leader, what metric am I trying to impact the most? Right. This is not super relevant if you have a lot of pipeline and you're trying to impact win rate or you have a lot of pipeline and you're trying to impact velocity. Um, what we're seeing across the board, a lot of companies we're talking to is pipeline conversion ratios are lower than they've been in the past. Right. So you have people that are trying to do two things. First, making sure we're on top of every opportunity to have good win rates. But secondly, what is our strategy to just get us into more opportunities? Right. Like you can't control a lot of the velocity stuff today. You're going to see deals slip based on the macro environment we are. So what this is, is really putting a more broad strategy around how do you help your team develop pipeline? So the problem that I constantly ran into is hey, here's some cadences you can run. Here's your target accounts. Here's your you know, Cognizum contact list, whatever that may be. But people need to realize that a lot of PG is about individual campaigns, just like marketing runs. So the goal of something like these PG kits is you can sit with your team and say, hey, let's look over the next quarter. Here's our different strategies outside of your normal prospecting that you're doing to A, keep it fresh, B, keep it exciting, and C, have different plans to see, okay, what's working, what's not. So some examples here and things that I've seen some of the best organizations do is they put together these PG kits, which is really a combination of brain power from sales, marketing, and ops, right? And the idea is you have weekly or two, three week sprints around what we believe are going to be high value activities that are going to lead to the best outcomes. So this you know, put some examples here, right? Whether this is, hey, we're doing a vertical focus push this week. Okay, that means that Sales needs to own what does that messaging look like? What is that first deck? What's the cold call script? Marketing needs to have a new version of the pitch deck, a new case study, a new video, whatever the assets that you're going to use. And RevOps should make it as easy as possible for the sales team to understand, here's the exact targets. Here's how we're going to measure our success. Here's how we're going to celebrate some of those wins. Now, I understand a lot of people don't have the RevOps resources to do this. You might be owning different components of this. But even if I didn't have the marketing support uh, and the rev op support, I would be building this with my team, right? Because then we're all aligned on here's what we think is the best strategy. I'd get people involved to brainstorm. Are these the right bets? What are the other bets we should make? What's the right order of these? And then you have different themes. So a vertical focus, a competitive rip out. Um, we're, we're trying to rally around a big event we're running. And then it's very easy to keep things fresh and keep people motivated. It's really demoralizing when you're like, Hey, I've been running the same play. I have shitty response rates. This isn't right. really working. If you're giving your team a losing play, they're not going to be motivated. Uh, so a question here um, from Christian. What if you run all three? How should you prioritize? Uh, run all three is in terms of these different themes. Oh, run all three in terms of sales, marketing, and rev ops. I'm ass I'm assume I, think I think that's what he was asking. But Okay, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I mean, this is what I would do is I would say, okay, let's assume you run all three, you have a handful. First off, that's a lot to do. So you might try to like go and get some RevOps resources, even if it's a consultant, et cetera. But um, hopefully you have the ops chops to kind of be able to set up a dashboard, understand the contacts. You're using products like a Cognizant to make that easy. But on the sales and marketing side, there's a lot of overlap. But what I would try to do is tap into your team right? To understand like, hey, we have some folks on our team that are really creative, really good at putting together some messaging. Maybe they own the deck. You have one of your best cold callers that's going to develop the script with you. So I would divide and conquer with your team. Also, when you're doing that subconsciously, your team feels like they're, they're developing the strategy and you're going to get better adoption. You're going to get better output. Like when you tell people, hey, do this versus what do you think? Let's co-create. Let's run this play together. You're going to get better adoption for the latter. So what I would do is, you know, figure out who are those top people with skill sets in each of these areas, co-create as much of this as possible. So it's not all on you and you're working 16 hour days. Yeah. Unless you like that. <laughs> <laughs> Christian, was that helpful? 
Okay, cool, cool, cool. That was good. Uh, anything else you want? I know there's a lot here. So anything you want to comment else on the, the PG kit for everybody, for anybody? I think the, the themes and the plays don't actually matter that much. The idea here is you have two, you know, one to three, one to four week sprints. That's going to be a concerted effort to understand what's working with good leading indicators. And what this is going to do is, again, I, I think about where can I just improve some odds? Right. And in this, what I think you're doing with something like this is you're decreasing the risk of seeing a bunch of reps not prospecting multiple weeks in a row, which will kill you. Right. Like that, that is the worst thing to happen. Right. So all this is doing is decreasing the risk. And I, I, I wouldn't get hung up on what are the right themes. You all have the right ideas or you wouldn't be in the position you're there. You'll know what those things are. But a lot of times you don't have the insight into what's what's coming down the product roadmap what's coming down on the marketing from event standpoint from a new product release so you have to get with someone in marketing someone in leadership to be able to look out a quarter right if, if you're mm -hmm. just looking one week out there's not enough planning that goes into it awesome so let's go to the to the next piece here now that we have the the PG kit example in order, uh, here's that operating cadence example. So we, we already talked about this. So again, this is something that y'all can use as a framework. This is what you could use moving forward uh, for whatever you want to do, right? But you you see that, okay, for the weeks that we have, this is how we're going about it. Now, from a sales manager level, this is what someone could be implementing immediately if they are a frontline manager. But also if you have the executives on the call too, this is something you start giving to your managers on how to be consistent with the weekly team meetings, pipeline, um, certain opportunities you're reviewing, et cetera. So I'm assuming from this screenshot we have here, Todd, it's about give, enabling your managers to use this effectively. Exactly. And you know, I don't think it, it, it matters so much on what's the right order or how often the week's happening. The key is just like you have to have a dedicated and programmatic way to say this is how we do forecasting. This is how we are always looking at pipeline activity. This is how I'm going to make sure once a month or once every 60 days, I have some type of skill, skills, career progression chat mm -hmm. uh, and some type of enablement plan. The better you plan this in advance, the more likelihood you're going to look like that calm sales manager that always seems to know what's happening versus the person running around unsure what they're going to do the next day. A good way to approach this if you're starting, you know, if you're ending the quarter here in June or if you're ending the quarter in July, go back and look at your calendar and see how much time you really spend, right? And then understand which of these things need to get more attention so that you're investing the small number of hours that you have on the highest outcome activities, ideally in as many one-to-many conversations as possible. And... When you have this operating cadence, you said one of many conversations. That's within the sales org, but how is it? How important is it for other departments to know this cadence? I think it's. I think it's important. I think the reason why it's important is because for enablement, you might have <clears throat> product coming to those meetings. For a new marketing campaign, you want someone from marketing involved in those meetings. If it's some type of, um, you know, new product education, you might have an SC involved. The more you can plan in advance, the better things will be. You'll get less cancellations. You'll get less no-shows, even internally, um, which again makes you look better and like you you you're actually managing or you know driving this plane appropriately, very intentionally as well. Exactly. You don't want to, you want to crash the plane. Yeah. <laughs> Intentional flying is key. Okay, so that's it in terms of the, the content. We wanted to give you all time here to to ask your questions. You know, I know I've been saying, hey, if you have questions, but now is definitely the time uh, because we, we're looking to we'll wrap up here if no one has any questions. But the goal is to answer some of your questions. So I know Christian, you had some that were coming in, but for everyone that is still listening in, if you have any questions around what was talked about here today, you have a question just around time management around sales leadership with Todd, now is the time to insert your question, whether in the chat or in the Q&A, um, et cetera. So if you do have questions, definitely put it in there. Uh, I would say my, my first question to you, Todd, is people think about what questions that they have as we wrap up here. Where should someone be? Fo where should someone start their time management activities? And so, what I mean by that is, should they be like start with the Google Calendar, like the obvious? Should they get a planner, right? Like, what are things that you see to be successful? I'd, I'd start with the inventory of your team to understand where do we think the biggest gaps are, what are the biggest metrics I'm trying to impact, and that'll change as the business matures or has some dips, etc. I think the second thing is 
doing a look back at your calendar and understand where you're actually spending your time, make a pie chart of that. Is that, is that the best things I should be doing? It's very easy to be like, Oh, I'll do that next week. I'll do that next week. Look at the end of the quarter, see where you're not investing the time in the right areas. And then that may be an enablement schedule that may be an updated operating cadence. That may be some PG campaign kits. That could be a SWAT team of someone from sales dev and sales and marketing that's trying to understand why our meeting to opportunity conversion ch changing, right? It, it really under, understand where the biggest problem is because you only can focus on so many things at a time, but you should leave this with like, okay, I need to look back at my calendar. I need to have some type of intentional operating cadence. And then what are the two or three bets that you want to make to try to impact a certain number? That's going to have the biggest, um, biggest bang for the buck. I love that. Okay. Well, Let's um, bring this question up here. It's a good question here. Okay. From Rick. Recently heard in a training that suggested managers should look to spend one hour outside of meetings with reps on a weekly basis. So not on the one-on-one -on -one deal coaching or on a sales call with a rep. Thoughts on this? And if something you agree with, how do you spend that time? It feels high to me. If you think you have normal one-on-ones and normal forecasting, like if you have eight reps, you're going to spend an hour on basically like, trying to build a relationship, build rapport, get to know this individual. That feels high to me. I think it should happen, but I, I don't know if I agree with that rule of thumb. Um, but I, I actually wouldn't get fixated on a number. Like there's people I've worked for leaders that I loved. We definitely didn't spend an hour outside of meetings with this individual, but they were, they cared about me, right? They knew what was happening in my life. They knew what was happening in my relationships. They knew what I was doing from a travel perspective. They sent these timely texts, right? So like, I think there's other ways to do it that don't require a full day because a full day feels like a lot. That Yeah, because if you have eight reps, that's a that's what, 16 wow. hours a week. If you're doing one-on-one -on -one and the outside of that, that's a lot going on. Yeah, interesting. So Rick, hopefully that's helpful if if you're going to take Todd's or take the other advice. Uh, okay, he agrees. <laughs> I was like, that just seems crazy to me. All right, so... When you're scaling a new sales team, everything seems important. With no historical data, very little pipeline, and a small but new sales team, what would be the best bang for my buck to focus on? That's a good question. Love this question. So again, I said this, but between Heap and Champ, I spent a year as a operator in residence, which meant, hey, Morgan's a nerdy engineer, never done sales and marketing, just got some funding, is going after some new category. You have no historical data. The way I think about things there, Christian, is you have a series of hy hypotheses that you're trying to prove or disprove. So is this the right ICP? Are these the right target accounts? Does our messaging resonate? What I see a lot of people fall into a trap is they're trying to test all of that at once. And I think you should still have, you can see I'm big on these calendars and like different <laughs> yeah, yeah. kind of um, campaigns, if you will. Uh, these campaigns are really testing. Even when we were starting Champify, we had a bunch of hypotheses around ICP, buyer profiles, et cetera. But I would look at them in a series of one to three week tests to try and to prove or disprove. And then once you see something starting to work, okay, put more activity, put more effort on that thing. But it's tricky with no historical data. Like you have to have hypotheses. And then I think that's why it's just like, getting to the operating cadence so you can get activities and, res and data to then figure out what to do from there is what it sounds like too. Exactly. Okay. Uh, okay. This is, this is an interesting one here. I'm going to put this up here. Post work from home COVID. Are you seeing over scheduling of internal calls lingering on the calendar for communications? Have you made efforts to find communication channels that are done async? Just curious if that's a burden in your environment. 100%. I think now we've kind of been accustomed to this, but you know, when, when I was running a sales org of like 50 people, we we're primarily in two different offices, you kind of saw everyone every single day. And then all of a sudden that changed. And yeah, you have to change how you go about communications and get more of it to async. I think some tactical things you do are like, and this goes into the next question about re reducing RAM time for BDR is like, we just hired our, uh, another SDR. You know, we have a channel where he says, here's what I'm going to do today. And at the end of the day, he says, here's where the results. It makes it very easy. I'm not asking him all those questions. He knows exactly what's expecting of him. I think, John, what you need to think about or what I would think about if I were you are, okay, what, how can I protect my team's time? It's like you need the one saying to the, to the VP of sales, to the CEO, hey, this is too much. Like I get it. We're doing some of these coffee chats, these you know, rotating one-on-ones. It's too much. Like I understand what you're trying to do, but you have to protect your team's time 
And then you have to figure out the ways to have one to many communications, which means, hey, we're all going to listen to these gong calls during this block at the same exact time, which means, hey, we're going to set up a Slack channel for any deal gets lost and require that a rep explains why. So you're making as much of those learnings happening async, not in scheduled meetings. Um, and then you just monitoring, is your team actually listening to the calls? Are they doing the right things? Um, how are I getting more of the reps to share this in meetings that I don't even need to be in? But you have to protect their time. Any Anything you want to add to the, you kind of already went into it, but anything you want to add to reduce the ramp time? I feel like you, you answered the majority. Ramp of time, I think most BDRs don't know what to do. Like, well, they don't know. <laughs> like, probably, they, they, they just don't. don't. Know what to do. Like, so give them that version of the recipe card, show them exactly what good looks like, understand what activity metrics they need to hit, and, and, and try to take as much of the decisioning off of their plate as possible, right? Who should they be targeting? What accounts are they picking? How many contacts at each account should they go after? How often should they meet with their AE? Like try to take as much of those decisions off their plate so they know exactly what they need to do. And then spend some time with them in your one-on-one -on -one, say, hey, what's taking more time than you think it should be? And your job is constantly, just like John's question, protect that time, right? If they're in trainings that, they, that aren't useful and they're in internal meetings that they shouldn't be in, you should be constantly trying to remove that from them so they're spending time on money generating activities. So, okay, cool, Eric, that's good. And then also I wanted to make sure, John, did that help answer your question on the post-work side? And then we have a question here from Maria. So in your opinion, what's the ideal number of direct reports for a sales manager? Um, she's obviously saying, hey, I, I know it all yeah. depends, but what's your ideal? Depends on the cycle. If they're really big deals, like five or six to one, if they're very SMB, you can see eight to nine to one. I think getting anything over nine to one is a bad idea. Um, you're probably feeling some crunch in this environment where it's like, oh, we don't need as much management overhead. Can we be more efficient that way? I think that's a, a bad bet. So I would say, you know, somewhere in the six to eight range is probably the right number. S and B, it could be higher or enterprise lower. How, how, also, do you have sales engineers, right? That could also help. That's true. Depends on the supporting assets around as well, but no more than eight. I did, I did 13. I thought that was going to be smart. It, wasn't, insane, it, was, yeah. it was not smart. <laughs> At one point, I was 10 or 11 for a short period. And you just see you're not doing a good enough job. And I think it's short-sighted. Well. Yeah. All right, y'all. These are great questions. If anyone has any lasting ones, feel free to drop them in. But as we wrap up here, Todd, where can people find you uh, and see what you have working on? I'm on LinkedIn, Todd Butzer. I try to put a lot of uh, some of the things we talked about out as much as possible. I try to be as tactical as possible. I think there's a lot of ideas. People have heard some of this. Hopefully you get a sense when I talk. It's like, look, I've been through a lot of the same challenges people are running into. I probably made worse mistakes than you have and trying to expedite a lot of learning. So I post probably three times a week on LinkedIn. Um, if you're looking for other creative ways to ramp BDR times or get more pipeline going, I think Champify is a great way in this environment. You can check us out at champify.io. Awesome, y'all. Well, hopefully y'all enjoyed this conversation and enjoyed Todd's advice. I know I learned a thing or two. So uh, we'll see you all next time at the next webinar that we have. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Feel free to reach out to Todd. And I hope you all have a blessed rest of your day. Cheers, everybody. Take care, everybody. See ya.